the starving artist. It's something about art that has caused many to run from their natural God-given talents to the secure cubicle, crunching numbers in order to maintain a consistent paycheck. But while this story is about an artist, it is not about a starving artist. Not a rich one either, but about an artist who taught himself and a generation of artists how to make their art work for them. This is the story of Walt Walker. He first learned the art of business. Then he learned the business of art. With his wife Jane as his business partner, you would be hard pressed to find one who has created and sold more images of black people at home and abroad. In the 1920s, separately, without knowing, Two families from Alabama, his from Drury, and hers from Tuscaloosa made their way to Detroit and the promise that the auto industry would give them a better life. Jane's family would wind up on the upscale west side of Detroit, while Walt's family chose to establish a store in a place known as Black Bottom. Walt's uncle Russell, who could pass for white, had no trouble setting up his store. Working seven days a week, this is where Walt learned the art of business. My uncle owned a store there, and it was almost like a 7-Eleven of those days. And uh, my uncle owned it, my father and his brother lived with him because their parents had died when they were young and they worked there. And, uh, you know, my father, I mean, my uncle was very well known in the neighborhood and was a little, he had a lot of business, did quite well. Of course, I've been paying for 25 years before moving to Los Angeles. In Detroit, I did uh, restaurants, nightclubs, uh, beauty parlors. I paid everything they'd want, hair designs for women. Although he made extra money as an artist, he followed conventional wisdom and enrolled in the Detroit Institute of Technology to study law. It was 1940. My name is Jane Carson Walker, and uh, I met Walt in a wedding. Uh, we, uh, I knew the girl, and he knew the boy. And when we got to the to the uh, w practice for the wedding, I told my girlfriend I want to walk with him. And at almost the same time, he told the boy he wanted to walk with me. And so that ended up the next year we got married. What became a 62-year whirlwind romance started May 2nd, 1941. He was just a nice young man. He had gone to school, he was in, in college, he was going for a law degree, but my husband would have made it a horrible lawyer, he's too honest. Skipping college, Walt worked for his uncle full time. His business had grown to include a hotel, and Walt even opened a couple of stores of his own in Inkster. His young family now included two sons, and he maintained his side art business, which ranged from signs, murals, and sketches of the characters in Black Bottom. Well, he had always done black people. When we were in Detroit, he used to do the characters who used to come in his uncle's liquor store. He would sit and do them and make them real, you know. And that's one of the things that I wish, being a young wife, I didn't keep them. But they were some magnificent 
black and white. At that time, he wasn't doing color, but pencil. And I just regret that I didn't save those along with all the rest of my memorabilia. Yes, um, I remember my father doing some mur murals in Detroit on some walls of some wealthy people and uh, doing, uh, you know, they had a lot of basements in Detroit. And I know, I remember one basement that my father had done uh, murals on the walls. And uh, he did very good murals, they were beautiful. And he also did some murals out here in California when we first came out. I remember there was a, uh, a rich uh, real estate guy in, uh, I guess basically it was in Watts, or between Watts and Compton, but this guy, his name was Kelly, in a big home with a pool and everything, and my father uh, did a mural on his wall around the pool, and it was in Jet Magazine. But Walt grew weaker from the sheer load of work. Jane dragged him to the doctor who diagnosed stress. He said, Walter, go to Detroit, uh, go to California, you'd love it. And so Walt and I took a vacation and came out and stayed a month, but I, I knew I wanted to move to California the, almost the next day, because it was in October, November, and Detroit is bad weather, snow, ice, and we had had a, an incident where a bus almost ran into us. I said, let's get out of here. The two headed west and set up housekeeping near 67th and Broadway in the heart of Black Los Angeles. Once settled, Walt took on a series of stopgap jobs, even cleaning toilets. As artists are known to do, he looked for work everywhere but at the end of his sleeve. And Walt always was dressed well, and the, the manager told him, said, Mr. Walker said, you really shouldn't have this kind of job. You've got brains to do something else. And so my husband came home, and we, we sort of sat and said everybody. He said, well, uh, if you give me a chance, I'll go out and see if I can get some work. I can paint what I see. And so me, I said, okay, baby, let's go. Dolphins of Hollywood maybe came before that, and uh, the, I think there was another place, uh, Nat Diamond, where he was a salesman. But I think it had to be uh, Western Auto that led right into the sign business because that's where he started doing signs because I think he saw somebody else uh, come and do these signs. He says, oh, I can do that. One day, uh, a guy came in and did some signs on the windows. And Walt told him, said, told the manager, I can do that. He says, okay, go down and buy some brushes and come and do it. So that started him into the commercial art business. He soon found that he could earn more money for working less time painting for Western Auto, then Norms, and businesses all over Los Angeles. But by that time, my husband knew enough about the sign business to go on his own. And so from there, we started, uh, he would go every day and stay four or five hours and he would come home with some money. Soon after, he landed an even better paying position at Safeway. Jane had a lot to do with that. I gave the manager at 104th and Avalon a card and told him that my husband was a commercial artist. We lived right around the corner from where the store was. Uh, because they gave me a chance to stretch and do the things I wanted to do. I would follow their advice. And they loved him, and when they opened the store, the stores looked beautiful because he could m make bananas look like bananas and greens look like greens. And so the, the, the head people liked him a lot. He met everybody from the top of Safeway in this district down to the janitor, and so it, it made our life better. 
things were looking up for the young Walker family, which now included four boys. Walt would go on to enjoy a 15-year career at Safeway. Having his sign business at home meant more time with Jane and the family. We enjoyed a, a few things together. You know, we, we watched the fights, which were on. You know, he was always preaching to us about this music, Duke Ellington, which he was addicted to. I mean, it was almost like nobody else did anything but Duke, but he, you know, he had his respect for Nat King Cole, people like that, but mostly Duke Ellington was it for him. My husband loved music. He loves Ellington and has a collection of Ellington records and, uh, over the years, and uh, so this is the way we started out. And uh, I remember one day, I think I was in uh, maybe high school or junior high school, and, uh, my father drives up and he's got this guy named Sam Woodyard in the car. Sam Woodyard was Duke Ellington's drummer. He brought Sam to our house and he was in our garage where my father painted his name on the drums. And, uh, you know, I got Sam to play a little bit for us, you know, on the drums. But, yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was one of really... Uh, exciting occasion, you know, the number one drummer with Duke Ellington was in our garage. Sam Woodyard. Hey. And uh, I found that his music, uh, the blues of his music, just really turned me on. And I found out that I could work listening to his music. And I do that after 50 years of uh, listening and painting this music. During the early 60s, African Americans began to see the world and themselves with new eyes. Cecil Ferguson, the first African American art curator for LA County, and his wife Miriam worked side by side with Jane and Walt. Ferguson remembers his struggle to include black art in the L.A. County museums. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was very difficult. Because how do you think that you work in a museum where you see nothing about your people? When the riots hit in 65, uh, my, we were already selling black art because my husband and a friend used to go up on La Cienica to the galleries, and they'd go on Monday night walk, and they would go in and out of galleries, but he never saw a black face. So my husband says, this is weird, so I'm gonna paint some black people. Ayuko Babu is one of the co-founders of the Pan-African Film Festival and Art Show. A lot of people were like locked into uh, into galleries, trying to get into gallery shows. He analyzed his, his, his situation, 
Bill was very important. He thought, he was a thinker. He said, look, most black artists are shed out of the galleries, the museums, um, the place up on Wilshire in Santa Monica. So I've got to find a place where my art is, is I, I gotta reach the people. And paint he did. He painted African Americans, Africans in the Caribbean, and Africans on the continent. He painted small boys and little girls, women and men. Soon his collection was bursting at the seams, begging to be shown. And then we moved down to Adams and Crenshaw, which was a better area for that. Painting black images was one thing, but selling them? The man who sold ice cream, records, and auto parts now believed he could sell art, black art. Nothing better to do it because I had a lot of training, and I've always taken great pride in what I do. So I opened the gallery, and eventually I had 15 other artists who displayed their work for me. Let me say this, he was part of the first wave in this period, meaning from in the 60s on down through the 70s that was out here putting black art out front in the public arena. He's the first person I remember selling black art. Charles Bibbs, an artist, is continuing Walt's tradition with his 626 Gallery downtown on Spring Street in Los Angeles. I don't know too much about uh, Walt and, and his gallery business, but I do know a whole lot about Walt and his influence in the street arts and that whole world, which is an entirely different world for artists. Uh, it's, a, it's a world of hard knocks and survival, okay, and Walt Walker was right there, you know, you know, right next to the well-established artists all the way down to the beginning, beginning artists, and he was just a figure that we just looked up to, you know. I think him and um, Cooper's originals, uh, Mr. Cooper, were probably the two main figures in Los Angeles that were very instrumental as far as African-American art goes. The trouble was, back then, black people didn't want black art, and you had a hard time giving it away. At that point, you couldn't. There was a time that our people were very reticent about buying black art. Maybe it was because they didn't see it or whatever. But once we opened up and they started coming and looking, it fascinated them. And we had, had uh, at that point, when we first started, we didn't have prints, so we had to sell originals. And I sold originals for $35 to pay the gas bill. They would rather look at caskets than to look at something that represented a lifestyle that we all have shared in one form or the other. And um, uh, it was incredible, and I felt really, I was really hurt. Now, I'm not the artist, but I felt hurt because of the, the reaction of the people. What helped build the business was a frustration in the air. Black people were no longer satisfied to recreate themselves in the image of whites. They sought their own images and transformed everything from their hair to the art in their homes. And the lady says, mm, what you got all those ugly pictures up on the wall? And her daughter said, mother, they look just like us. You know, even back then, back in those days, in, in, the, in, the, in the home that I grew up in, we didn't have works on our walls. We had a picture of uh, Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy and a whole bunch of family photos, and that was it. We just wasn't into uh, the cultural aspects of African-American art. For a long time, you go into a black home, you saw something like Jesus Christ, of course, you know, on the cross, whatever. I'm not religious. If you are, I'm sorry. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, uh, what's her name? Eleanor. And later on, John Kennedy and his wife, right? 
you went and you see calendars uh, in people's home with a number of white people. Right. You don't see nothing here where white people are. Everyone worldwide does what we do, good, bad, or indifferent. So we are image makers, and people emulate us. When we ourselves see the value in what we do, and what we say, and how we are, then the, our glory will come up. Like the hit records he sold back in Detroit, Walt had hit art pieces that he sold worldwide. As the black consciousness movement took shape, street festivals were another way of exhibiting Walt Walker originals. Walker was very instrumental during that time. And that's when I was a street artist. Uh, I remember times going to these, these shows. Walt Walker was always the first one there. He always got the best spaces. He always got the best consideration. He was always the featured artist. And we just followed suit. You know, I remember, you know, just walking in. And sometimes we would walk in late. Walt, Walter's, Walt Walker's already there. And he's smoking this cigar, and he says, hey, boy, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? You know, you, you, do you always come late? But well, he and Jane was out there in that hot sun, so that I were. But it was the businesswoman in Jane that made sure Walt's art was affordable. Uh, I told him, I said, I'm going to find a way so that mother in the projects can buy a print can get a picture. So I started researching it, where we could get prints made off of his uh, artwork. And the first print we put out, the little boy with the pot. And it's, we sold 1,500 in a day and a half at a dollar. But while by doing the uh, photographic prints, you probably sold it something for $35. Fifty dollars. It all depends on which one it was. Right? And they they really wasn't starving. That was a heyday because Bill Cosby had all those artists on on television every week, and uh, so Burnett, Burnett Honeywood and everybody took off, and black folks were hungry to for the art show because the '60s was over, and that's a, this is a very important part in terms of Walt's role. The '60s had collapsed around '75. Nothing was happening, so by the 80s, people were looking for something again, and Barbara put that together. We turned the art show over to the Baldwin Scrimshaw Plaza staff, um, Hagen, the owner. So we came uh, like 97, 98, we moved down in 95, and we would negotiate each year. So we came to the negotiations in 97, 98, and um, uh, we were talking, they asked us, they said, we're going to drop the art show, because we can't have our staff people running the mall and running the art show. So they said, do you guys want it? He said, yes, we'll take the art show because it's, we think it's a nice synergy between the art and film and people like that, that event. So it was like, you know, by accident, the event came together like that. Walt was an elder statesman, so he didn't actually participate directly in all the discussions, but he would, uh, I remember one time we were having hassles with the artists, with the fine artists, who resented the fact that we were not artists who were going to run the art show and that we were in the film. And so we're not filmmakers either. We really come out of community organization and politics. Uh, so they were arguing with us. And so Walt says, he pulled me aside one day and says, listen, y'all run the art show. The artists can't run the art show. That's the good thing about this business now is that African-American people are moving up the economic ladder. So when that happens, people who are buying fine cars, who are, who are selling fine cars, who are selling art, who are selling, you know, you know, 500 to a million dollar homes, you know, they're seeing, they're seeing a lot of black faces, okay? And thank God to that situation, we, we have benefited too. A lot of African-American artists have benefited. Walt's commercial art gained the attention of Jack Kent Cook, then owner of the Los Angeles Lakers, back in the Wilt Chamberlain heyday. He painted everything from the logo on center court to the numbers on the seats. And uh, he painted probably every seat in the whole forum. 
put numbers on every seat. And he used to go and maintain those things all the time because uh, Cook, the owner, didn't, you know, he really mean, wanted everything perfect all the time. There was none of this, you know, scratched up seats or anything like that. He fixed everything all the time because this guy was immaculate. And my father, uh, he would call my father, uh, you know, on weekend, whatever, he needed something done, some change, some kind of advertisement done. And my father would, uh, you know, go over and take care of it. Mr. Cook owned a horse ranch up, uh, up in Northern California. Walt did signs for that, made on wood. And everything that was commercial for him, Walt did it for Jack Kent Cook. And uh, I know that uh, my father would put in a bill and Cook would see and he says, uh, give me that bill. He would double that bill. He would actually double the bill and say, here, take care of Walt. He said, I can't ask for him to give me a show. I said, if he likes you well enough, he will. And so one day, Walt got his Sunday meeting clothes on and went up there and asked him. Mr. Cook said, why, sure, Walt, I'll give you a show. When do you want it? I said, well, uh, any available date. And uh, I said, well, what will it cost me? Because I figured I had to pay for something. He said, oh, Walt, well, it won't cost you anything. Say, uh, we, we'll, we'll give you a show. So he gave me, I picked the date out, and he gave me a show. And so we had the only art show that has ever been given up there. And uh, it was very successful. And uh, Walt's name was above the Lakers. And possibly my best show was at the Forum. The fabulous Forum, as Jack Kent Cook called it. He gave me a show there. Uh, the champagne flowed like water, and so from then on I, I knew I could make it as a fine artist rather than just a commercial artist. It was a turning point in my career from uh, commercial art to fine art. Walt is perhaps best remembered for his presence at Ray's Redwood Kitchen at 39th and Western over a span of 10 years. Ray's Kitchen was the spot for the best breakfast in town. A friend of ours uh, was taking lessons from Walt, and uh, it, the owner of Ray's Kitchen was getting ready to move from 36th place to 39th. Uh, ask her if she could put pictures in, she was an artist, uh, into his gal in his, this little room they had they couldn't put any tables in and she 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 was too scared to do it so then she told him she said well my teacher probably will do it so my husband being who he was uh, accepted the challenge and we moved in and we stayed there for 10 years and, and we sold uh, artwork to everybody from uh, Isabel Sanford, Lynn Hamilton, uh, just about, and, but we kind of concentrate on the average person, the, the guy that goes to work every day and doesn't, you know, uh, because to get somebody with big pockets, you don't get that every day. But we did okay because the work was done. It, it was well done, and uh, and and our people could appreciate that. They we made them look good. The first time I saw him was at Ray's Kitchen, and that was like uh, I wasn't even involved in art at that point. But I was amazed that here was this brother with the tam and his cigarette holder with this art in the in the lobby of Ray's where we're getting grits, hamburgers, hot dogs, etc. But he was selling high art. And and there on every Sunday he was there pushing art and elevating the culture, but it was clearly a business. Long lines, first restaurant I've ever seen that that uh, um, 
a person of color had that had to wait an hour to eat. Because it was always crowded. We had to wait to get a, a seat to eat. So what's the best thing to do is go in the gallery and, and browse around. And uh, Walt and Jane started selling a lot of artwork because the timing was perfect. Jen continues to show Walt's art, which includes pieces many have never seen. Here, Walt walks us through his gallery of favorites. Number one, it's, it's called Sisters. So oh, you'd be surprised that younger people buy it because they think in terms of their mother and aunt. And it's, it's a rural setting, so it reminds me of where they're from. So uh, that's my biggest seller, most successful one. Well, I try to put myself into whatever I paint. Uh, I put as much effort in painting a log as I would in painting a person. Of course, he carries a spear with him. You don't see the spear, but if you tinker with the cattle, you'll see the spear. That's a Bohemian woman uh, in, a, in a Bohemian islands. You find people that look like that and dress that way. I think I hit on something there. Well, the hands are always a challenge. Actually, you can spend as much time on the hands as you would on the face. I, I love doing uh, still life because I can eat it when I finish. Well, uh, I wanted to show a, a child, and, I, and I, a child is my favorite subject, and, and an older person. So I call it two generations and they're walking into the city. Now, what they're going to find in the city is, who knows? So that's called two generations. And it's, it's really pushing up into maybe second place. Now, these uh, pictures here are from my son's backyard in Hawaii. Now, I painted all of these during the hurricane watch. I uh, went several days that the whole city was under hurricane watch. And uh, people knew what they had to go in case the house started blowing down. So uh, I painted all these pictures during that time. I like to experiment and uh, come up with something different. Pierre, I, I like that. That's my favorite because I knew him. He used to come in the restroom where I had a gallery. And he'd talk about any subject and he he was wounded during the war, and because he had a certain personality that, that people like. That's Chicken George. I decided I would like to do all of the characters and roots, but I couldn't get a picture. So finally we got a call from a man that said, well, he had a picture of Chicken George. I went out to the studio and gave me a black and white. So I just, I picked out the colors that I thought it was, should look like possibly the first painting of Chicken George ever. Of course, I've been painting for 25 years before moving to Los Angeles. In Detroit, I did uh, restaurants, nightclubs, uh, beauty parlors. I painted everything they'd want, hair designs for women. When I first opened a gallery, I didn't have enough pictures to, to fill it up. And so I started painting different subjects under pseudo names. And one fellow walked in and he, he walked around inspecting closely each picture and saying that, well, this fellow's very conservative. I can tell he's conservative. This fellow, he drinks a lot. And all the time, he was talking about me and he didn't know it because I had a different name on each picture. I did that to fill the gallery up. Eventually, I ended up with the 15 artists that I could display their work so I could tell the truth.
So the key to the whole thing is being able to draw. When I painted that, my wife said, every church has an old lady like that. She sits in the front row and she corrects the minister if he makes a mistake. So uh, I, I got the name from a Duke Elton tune called Come Sunday. Okay. And you'll find her in uh, most of the churches on Sunday morning. They must really love it because it's very disappointing when you start out. Okay. But you can't quit. You can't quit. Mm -hmm. And if you do something, you've got to show it. Uh, I admire a lot of artists. I really admire their work. But when I paint, I want to be me. I want to be Walt Walker, mm -hmm. not someone else. Exhibiting for an artist is the lifeblood to financial fitness, and Walt was in constant demand. He was invited to exhibit his works from Los Angeles to Florida, New Orleans, New York, Atlanta, and even Hilo, Hawaii. So I like any type of subject. I started painting black subjects because no one else was doing it, not commercially. Then I had to find out how to make a living doing it. Walt Walker, I would say, is a popular artist. He was an entrepreneur. We're learning. We're learning. Uh, and one of the things I've talked to Nathaniel, a lot of people have said they've learned from the African artists who come here like a line, and they see that the artists do everything at one. They, 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 they work, they do this, whatever's necessary to make it happen. So I, I think we've gotten mature on that level and quit trying to be, you know, starving artists and fall out dead. And Considered a popular artist. You're going to hear that name uh, mention when people start to study this whole new renaissance for African-American art. Uh, this year, one of the artists walked out of there with about $90,000 of sales. Because people, you know, not just celebrities, but people really want to buy uh, pieces. Um, he did both. He was, he was a practical artist. So he had the originals and he had the prints. When we came out here, we went to school to know how to run the business. He and I both went, because whatever he did, I did. We didn't do anything without each other. There are artists who are trailblazers, you know, the Walt Walkers, the Jacob Lawrences, and and Elizabeth Catlett and Remar Bearden and the, and the list goes on and on. Okay, I'm not considered necessarily one of those type of artists. I'm considered a popular artist. What is a popular popular artist? An artist, a popular artist is an entrepreneur. Walt was one of the first people that merged that, that really said, I'm an artist, but I'm a businessman. I'm running a business. We're going out and putting the big ads in the magazines. We're going out to the big trade shows. We're going out and we're giving private shows in our own homes. We're in inviting guests to come in. We're the ones that are going out and, and buying galleries and representing our, our peers and coming together and figuring out ways that we can put that art in the hands of our people. I always said art is something that symbolizes that individuals have arrived to a certain status in life because art is something that you don't need. You can't eat it, you can't drive it, it can't put shelter over your head. But it's one of those things that you own when you can afford it, okay? Art is something that if you have the disposable income, that's what you buy. You buy fine cars and you buy art. It's a, it's a, it's a status symbol. Everybody knows uh, Malcolm's quote about the field Negro and the, the house Negro. But they both was on the plantation. And nobody really deals with that, that the field Negro is, is really a plantation Negro. And the house Negro is really a plantation Negro, except they got a class division with the house and the field. Well, there's always been Africans that were not on, in the, not on the plantation, were not house Negroes, but field Negroes. They're what we call swamp niggas, the Maroons. Black folks who was free out there in the world trying to steal off the plantation, trying to maintain some liberated zones, trying to follow their vision about what they want to do with their life and go forward. Well, Walt was one of these people. 
he was one of the original swamp Negroes, swamp African, that said, okay, because he'd been on the plantation. He'd been working for, I think, uh, sports arena and, and all these jobs. But he decided at one point that I want to be free. I'm going to be charged my own life. I'm going to organize myself. Because it's very difficult to organize yourself out in the swamps. Organize it was out there at the beach, out there at, at Ray's Kitchen, come at the Pan African Film Festival, a systematic, organized life. And I think that he was um, he he was an example for a lot of us figuring out how to move into the swamps. A man of such stature will, of course, rub shoulders with the rich, famous, and powerful and be bestowed with honorary degrees and honors, such as the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pan-African Film Festival in 1999. The award was presented by Quincy Jones. It was, it was one of those electrical moments. Rare thing, because Quincy um, didn't know who he was, per se, but had kind of seen him, like everybody kind of seen Walter around. Quincy may have saw him in Rays or may have saw him at, through the art show. But when they had their interaction, it was very interesting because it was like two masters meeting each other. Because Quincy's done the same thing in the music business. Walt's creativity makes his life story worth telling. But the backdrop to that talent is the love and partnership he had with his wife, Jane. That who helps me is her, uh, my biggest booster. And she kept me going during the uh, time that it was real rough, mm -hmm. selling black art. I love Walt Walker because yeah, it's such a great love story, right? I'm a sentimentalist anyway, especially about black people, because they always say that black people don't stay together, you know. And, and sure, that's a lie, because Walt Walker and Jane really just proved that, right? My mother was probably his, well, she was the biggest promoter. And um, without her, he might not have done a lot of these things because. He didn't have anybody else that could really back him up. You know, a lot of artists get people that uh, support them when they're up there in their painting. And they say, oh, you just go paint and I'll take care of all your bills and all that kind of thing. But he never had that. I don't think most of the black artists had anybody like that. That role model was a very important role model for me and other people because they had clearly worked out how to live together, you know, which is very difficult. Over 40 years, how long they were married, and how to run a business together, and then how to stay in love, and how to do some art and some passion. And you're lucky if you have a spouse that believe in the same thing you believe in, uh, because uh, women are about security, you know, and start pushing a program and, and say, "This is what I'm going to do," and da 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 da, you know. So they, they were successful in figuring that out and making that happen. And there's very few people who have figured out how to live together, how to work together, and how to be driven by a vision. And I always was so amazed by the diligence with which Mrs. Walker was going to show her husband's wares. Because she, in her own mind, he was the best artist in this world and she made whatever persons were there feel that they must have some of his artwork to put in their own homes or give his gifts and that sort of thing. And I just liked her um, tenacity. And well, it seems like Jane was the one handling all the art too. <laughs> but uh, she was happy to do it. She also seemed to have understood what her role was. I mean, so many people, I think, fall out because they don't know what their role is supposed to be. She understood he was the artist, she was the business person, and they put that together. I think without her, Walt, <laughs> Walt couldn't do it. I say well, sometimes Walt be sick and she'd be carrying in all the stuff, you know? so. Uh, without her, 
you know, it's just like me and my wife. I mean, they always said there was always behind every great man, there's a great woman. And uh, in Walt Walker's case, it's perfect. The legacy of Walt Walker is a body of artwork that includes hundreds of oil paintings, sketches, murals, and illustrations, and sheer perseverance and determination to create that art, even in the face of health challenges, all of which empowered him to forever lay to rest the notion of the starving artist. And so I tell people just to stick with it. When I give a show, I save so much of the proceeds to buy material to put on the next show. Uh -huh. And the next show. You can't go out and blow your profits after a successful show. Now, as you know, like you said before, there's no more, you don't have to be a starving artist. Because, you know, as long as you uh, stay with the times and stay up with technology, uh, like I do, you know, I had to learn at a young age to get into the computer, learn graphics, Photoshop, Dreamweaver, Corel Draw, Quirks. And, you know, I'm able to still do something that I enjoy, which is still, it's just another form of art. Um, and still maintain, you know, my household, pay my bills. There, nowadays, you, you, there's no such thing as a starving artist if you want to work at it and do good work. Learn your craft. That's the main thing. I think for me, uh, Walt Walker laid the foundation down for us, you know, and I'm following in his footsteps and um, doing the same thing he was doing, combining the art with the business. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for people like Mr. Walker. Well, see, Walt Walker knew one thing. He knew, he knew the system of numbers. He knew that selling art was a numbers game. I, it took me a long time to understand that, okay? Um, a lot of artists would say, I wouldn't sell my stuff that cheap. Okay, but Walt Walker had, he was way ahead of his, ahead of his time, okay? Because he knew that the more art he got out there, the more it would come back to him. Okay, and a lot of times it come back to somebody with, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars want to buy originals. But if if he didn't saturate the the uh, his market, okay, nobody would have known Walt Walker. And the way you do that, you have to get the images out there. You have to get the name out there. And one of the things I've learned from Walt, that was one of the things I learned from him before I went into business for myself. It's many times is uh, the keeper of the history, and they also show you what's going to happen in the future. They're the visual historians. Um, and artists, like the African artists on the continent, as opposed to Africans born in diaspora and Africans born on the continent, there's a difference between the artists who are born on the continent and born in the diaspora. Uh, we in the diaspora have gotten caught up with um, uh, uh, Western uh, separation. So I'm an artist. I'm a businessman. I'm an art. I don't know nothing about business. I'm a filmmaker. You know, I'm a writer. I'm not a businessman. In Africa, every, it's all one. You you are an artist. You're a businessman. You're a farmer, and they don't see any difference. And so they manage all that together. Whereas we get hung up with just being an artist or just you know, being a business, not merging it. Art. Uh, um, Walt was one of the first people that merged that. As time went on, Walt and Jane scrambled to keep up with the demand on Walt, but his health began to deteriorate. He had a number of heart attacks. Three on record, mm -hmm. uh, verified by the hospital. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one I think I had, but uh, I didn't make it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. lived to a ripe age of 84, then passed away October 13, 2002. While Jane and Walt used to show their paintings at Venice Beach, Jane put a sign up saying 62 years and still speaking. This would get a chuckle from passers-by but Jane continued on after her 62-year love affair with Walt. Very difficult. However, 
I guess I made a very good investment getting my granddaughter. I called her and asked her if she would like to come and live with me because I have two bedrooms, three bedrooms. And uh, I said, I just can't live by myself again. I mean, uh, uh, at all. And so she says, okay, Grandma, I'll move in. And so it's proven very well for us. Uh, I'm getting ready to put on a show, and I'm on the internet, waltwalker.com. I've gone back to school. I'm the oldest one in the class, <laughs> and the teacher loves it. <laughs> and, and they wrote me up in the school. Um, but I just enjoy going. I'm learning to spell again, to do math, which I never could do, and uh, learning the computer. The next generation of walkers lives on in Dee Walker, a noted spoken word artist. She set it all up for us. He painted for her, he once said. He knew she was the woman he would wed, said she was the most beautiful picture he ever did see. A whirlwind courtship, and soon they were married. And living in Detroit, they started a family, soon moving to LA to begin history. And as the stories are recanted to me, I listen attentively because it describes love the way they wanted it to be. You see, 62 years ago, Walt met Jane, instantly falling in love and giving her his last name, vowing to her father to love and cherish her as he did. A promise Walt kept even throughout the bearing of four kids. He took on odd jobs so they could live, and she stayed at home to give love and support, for she also loved him, the man, and the art. Ask anyone, and nothing could pull these two apart. They said what they did for each other was from the heart. So they began working in the community, seeing a need to bring unity and pride back to the way black folks saw themselves. And looking at the pictures, you could see it through their eyes. My grandpa said the way others portrayed us were lies. And with the stroke of his brush, he would provide mirrors and images elegant and alive. He didn't stand for over-exaggerated lips or bugged eyes. He painted from natural beauty what other races wanted us to hide. And my grandma stood right by his side, and together they would meet and greet Jane sitting at the table and Walt standing on his feet. Everyone knew this pair, and if you saw one, you knew the other was there. And together they shared love and dreams and wasn't real big on material things. And as long as they could hear Duke Ellington sing, sophisticated lady, Grammy still smiles. Although she misses him, she brags on how they kept their vows till death did they part. And before he passed, he told her she was the inspiration to his art from the start. I painted those for you, so do with them what you want. And Jane says she's still in love with Walt. Now that's love. 62 years and counting is no front. And hopefully, the message will shine on the rest of us to paint life and love to the fullest.